So number one, starting, oops. Starting on February 5th, 2018, you will get, there will be, a quiz every, uh, excuse me, at the beginning of class. It will be one question. It might have more than one part, but it will be one question. You will have limited time to answer it. Period. If if it is material we have covered then it will be graded for accuracy. That's it. So if I give you a, uh, an osmosis question and you get 50%, then that's the percentage on that quiz you got. Is that clear? So that stuff we covered heavily, you should know it. If you don't know it, you better start reviewing. Well, what question am I going to get, Mr. Mendoza? Who knows? I'm reaching in a bag, I'm pulling out a question. And you got to answer it. Can I tell, right? I mean, that's fair. You're going to, in, in two months, you're going to get into a course exam. It's going to have those questions on there. If, however, if it's material, if I reach in a bag and I pull out a question that's, that we haven't covered, well, right? Then what we're going to do is we're going to call it a pre-quiz. So all I'm looking for is that you've completed it and that you're close, that you're within the same ballpark. I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect you, if I put up a cladogram, where would you organize this creature, and your answer is DNA, then, I'm, no, it's a zero. If you put, a, you know, you give some answer, and it's reasonable, then we're fine. Is that clear? That's my pretest. Any pretest questions, just me wanting to know where, how much you understand of that particular topic. Oh, my God. I don't know what else to say. I, I wrote it down. Yeah. Uh, how you have a what method am I to test you? Probably it'll be a Juno. It could be a piece of paper and you just uh, have photocopies and then you pick it up and do it and then turn it in. Uh, but it's going to be ready for you. One way or the other, it'll be ready for you. I already have all the questions. I've already have them in a file. I've counted them out. I know all the questions you're going to have every day. I say one. If we get behind, it might be, I should write here, one to four questions. Of course, the longer the questions, the more time I feel it should take for you to do it, with an, and I'll try to be very reasonable, the longer, the more time you're going to have to get it done. Does that make sense? But if you're, walking, if you're walking in here late, I don't want to hear that so-and-so held you up or I had other things to do. That's okay with me, but that impacts your grade on that quiz. Is that clear? You can have me, give me a pass telling me you were, were coming from so-and-so or whatever. I'm okay with whatever it is, right? As long as I have a pass, I know you came from an adult. 
But this is non-negotiable. The quiz is going to start and it's going to stop. And if you're absent with an excuse, of course you can make it up, but it's going to be after school. And we're going to keep moving, okay? Because we have no time. This is a train. We're on a train now. Yes. It doesn't matter. You get here, if you get here five minutes before class starts, you can have an extra five minutes. I don't care. It, I will stop it at a certain amount of time. The time will differ depending on how long the question is after class starts officially. Am I clear? So if I think you have one minute, I think one minute is enough time for you to answer the question, I'm going to start it. I'm going to stop it one minute after class is supposed to start. When is class supposed to start? 2.21. So when am I going to stop the, the, te the quiz? 2.22. If I think it's only going to take a minute, then that's what I'm going to do. If I think it's, you know, if it's a question like choose one, uh, you know, I don't know what would be a good question. Is this a prokaryote or eukaryote? And you have, you know, bacteria and a plant cell. That should take you less than a minute. It should take you 10 seconds, right? So if you can if you can do that, then if I think it's, it should take a minute, then 222 is in. And 222, give me the quizzes. Done. Of course, I will try to have them all laid out for you. I'll have the last class lay them out for you in all the seats. So you have zero prep time. Just come in, do the quiz, turn it. Yeah. Yes. Are we all clear on this? It's starting on Monday, and we're moving on. Tests are graded. Interim progress reports are due Monday. So on Monday, I'm going to put a grade in. I'm going to go through to, uh, today, tomorrow, and if you turn in your assignments and they're accurate, you're going to get your points for them. Is that clear? I have already finished second block. I have a lot of missing assignments in second block. Some people say they uploaded, some people said they just didn't do it, some people said they read, some people said they didn't read. One, one student I know uploaded all the documents into one assignment. That's not what you were told to do, was it? You have chapter 10 reading, it should be uploaded to chapter 10 reading, etc. So there's all this stuff that's going on, all this, and it stems from not listening, but I'll, we'll move on from that. My point is, if you're concerned that your work has not been uploaded, you need to stay after school and verify it with me. Or not. It's okay if you don't. But if it's not there, I got nothing to grade. Does that make sense? And I have to put it, I'm going to put an F. I mean, I think that's fair. If it's not there, it's an F. All right. So if it's there and it's, and it's, reasonably done well, and then you have an A. If you miss in parts of it, then you'll get a grade accordingly. Or if your answers are just plain wrong, you're going to get a grade accordingly. Is that understood? I just want to be clear in how I communicate with you. All right. Any other questions about, uh, about what's going on with grades and how they're getting done? Okay. Did everybody feel like the test was fair? Yeah, yeah I thought it was fair, too, but I want to make sure that you all think it's fair because you're the ones that count, right? Uh, I, again, with, with remediation, you have to come after school. We have to discuss where you went wrong. I have to point out resources so that you can work on improving that, and then sometime after that, you can retake the test. If you miss the test, it's an essay exam. So you have, to, you have to schedule that with me after school sometime. I will not be here Saturday. I have a funeral to go to. Sorry for you. Number one, yeah, it's, it's not my loss, but thank you. It's my, one of my, it is my loss in a way. It's one of my colleagues, one of my fellow teachers whose mom passed away. I want to be there for her. And also, I thought it was a good opportunity because you guys are going to be busy with English remediation. And math, too, right? And math and English, is that right? Did I understand that correctly? So you'll be doing math and English remediation tomorrow in different workshops. 
So I thought, well, even though I wanted to come in and maybe pick up any stragglers that feel like they could do some biology, I really feel like I should be there for my colleague, and so that's what I'm going to do. But I will be here after school today. I'll be here after school every day next week. Please feel free to stop. One student asked me if she could come in in the mornings. Usually, yes, but we'll see what happens. You have to schedule that with me. I don't want to commit to being here Monday morning until I talk to my wife and we figure out what's going on this weekend. All right? All right. Cladograms. This is a cladogram. It's a complicated cladogram with different bacterial species. All right? It looks complicated, doesn't it? I mean, I, I know what's going on here. I'm looking at it, and I'm telling you, it looks complicated to me. But actually, cladograms are really not that difficult if you understand what they mean, right? So let's break it down. Let's start at the beginning and then move through. And let's take notes. Of course, I'm recording this. All right, so cladistics is from the ancient Greek for branching, right? So it just means branches. And everybody here has heard of family trees, right? Yeah. And the idea is that some great, 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 great grandfather is at the bottom of the tree, the tree roots, right? And grandmother, grandmother, grandfather at the tree roots. And as you move up the tree, and the, the trees branch, they, the brothers and sisters have, have children that are now cousins, and the cousins have babies, right? And as you move up the tree, you get more and more branching. Do you understand that? Do you understand that concept? So, so it would be like you're here, and your brother's here, and your mom and dad are here, and their mom and dad are here, and their mom and dad are here, and their mom, you see what I'm saying? So the further down from the ends, the ends of the tree, right, the tips of the branches, the further down towards the trunk you go, the older that ancestor is, the more, the, the more fundamental they are. Do you agree? So if you have a baby, you have one baby, but this great-grandfather had many, many, many hundreds of babies, right? Does that make sense to everybody so far? We're good? All right. So we can, we can classify a, a species of organisms into things called clades. So maybe instead of talking about families, what if we talked about organisms that shared common characteristics? It's just that simple. Let me, uh, let me say something like, like, man, like all of these things here share, maybe they all have these characteristics. They all have, uh, let's, let's say four characteristics. And let's say the four characteristics are hair, uh, maybe uh, uh, live birth. Uh, if they have hair, do they have hair and feathers? I'm not sure if that's possible. But we'll say hair, live birth, uh, warm-blooded. And we'll say, how can they be warm-blooded and cold-blooded? Oh. I, I, I'm grouping these, all these organisms have these characteristics. Does that make sense? And they all feed milk to their children. All right. What kind of, a bird has hair? No. <laughs> Everyone's confusing me. That's a mammal. So that's a mammal. This would be the clade that we call mammals, right? But there's a problem with this. There's a problem with these old systems of nomenclature. The old system nomenclature. Naming, nomenclature, naming, nomenclature, naming. So nomenclature, there's an old, there's a problem with this old system, and the problem is that this system of nomenclature is based on a group of European men, old European men, probably well-informed, working their way through a system of uh, uh, apprentices, apprenticeship system where they work for somebody who work for somebody who work for somebody. And they named things. They sat in the basement of a natural history museum and they named things. Maybe they traveled there, maybe they didn't travel there. But there are problems with doing this. There are problems because you're really limiting yourself to what kind of characteristics could group a, gr a group of living systems or organisms. Let's talk about that in just a second, and what I mean. I hope you'll understand what I mean in just a minute. Uh, dinosaurs, crocodiles, are all descendants of, a, of uh, living or, or extinct. We all have, all of them have 
have common descendants or common ancestors, right? Uh, birds, dinosaurs, crocodiles all have a common ancestor. In fact, today, scientists call birds what? Dinosaurs. They're dinosaurs. They're classified as, in general as a dinosaur. And we have fossil impressions of, of, of creatures that look like dinosaurs, but they have feathers. So a lot of this is how you define them. How do you group them? For instance, you could take a dinosaur, a lizard, uh, a cheetah, and a bird, and you can find common characteristics, right? They all have eyes. Do you agree? Not every living thing has eyes, right? But these four things do. So they have, they have that in common. Uh, they all have ears. Uh, they all have... Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, okay, skin, that's a little, yeah, okay, skin, they have skin tissues, they're multicellular, right? They're eukaryotic, they're, so we can group them in all kinds of groups, right? But today we group things as, you know, we would say, how you, a lot of people are trained in middle school and elementary school as we look at this creature and we call it a what? What is this creature here? It's a cheetah. It's a, yeah, it's a cheetah, I think you're right. Uh, you laser feet. I, I like cheetahs. I can tell you that. But cheetahs. Big, cat, that's my big cat. Okay. A mammal. a mammal. You call it a mammal, right? And you guys would would say, what is a mammal? What is a mammal to you? A what? It's an animal. Okay, mammal. But not all animals are mammals. So what's special about the animal mammal? It's warm. I heard more blood. So it gives live birth. Has hair and fur or fur uh, is warm blooded uh, what was do you know where the word mammal comes from it goes from uh, it comes from a word called mammary gland and mammary glands are the glands that make milk so all mammals have females that make milk right to give to their young so that's another quality right mammals right so it's, I think you're right. I mean, you're not wrong. Everything you're saying is absolutely right. That's how we've been trained, right? Mammals have fur hair. They have live birth. They have the placenta. Most they, they have placenta, right? Live, but they have live birth anyways. Uh, they have uh, they have fur, and they produce. Now you know they produce milk, right? So that's what we know about mammals so far. But wait a minute. What about what about a duck-billed platypus? A duck-billed platypus. It has fur. It has... Hey, wait a minute. Wait, I'm confused now. I'm thoroughly confused. You said ma mammals give live birth. But duck-billed platypus, you're saying, is a mammal because it has fur, but it lays eggs. Is it a reptile? Rep, but it's warm blooded. Yeah, reptiles lay eggs. Huh? Huh? You thought mammals were part of the fish group? Or, no, like, no, we'll talk, no, because they give birth, like, honestly. All right, uh, there's, there are a few fish that do give a sort of live birth, that one example is a shark, right? So this, so this classification system starts to break down, is my point, right? The, cla the point is that the classification system all of a sudden starts to break down. In fact, for how many times, what do we call a jellyfish? A fish. A fish. I mean, people call jelly. We call it jellyfish. Why would you? Why would we call it jelly? It's not a fish. Not related. It's so far. We are closer to fish than the jellyfish are. Right? We have more in common with fish than jellyfish do. Right? The only similarity between jellyfish and a fish is that they both swim in the ocean. That's pretty much it. Yeah. Are they made of jelly? No, they're not made of jelly. Okay, look, this is being recorded, so let's think before we speak. All right? Yeah. What is a jellyfish considered? If it's not a fish. Let's talk about that a little later. 
All right, because it's, I mean, our, as you can see, we're starting to get a little bit. You're right; it's not a fish, and and you know, if you read Moby Dick, Moby Dick what you have to think about is that in a, in a sort of classic novel, right? There's a giant whale in it, uh, and and the guy's hunting him, and the guy's hunting them, right? And in the in the in the novel Moby Dick. It's it's hilarious. It, it's it, to me it's funny because they always talk about the fish. Because they what did they think of whales as fish? fish. But we today we know they're mammals. Because they used to think fish do what? Swim. swim in the ocean. So anything that's in the ocean is swimming is a fish. But it's all about it's, it's the classification system breaks down. I mean, it just goes over and over again. You can find example act three. If it was just one exception, if it was just the duck-billed platypus, then you say, okay, well, that's life. But it's not just the duck-billed platypus. There's example F, there's fish that fly, or at least glide, right? Flying fish. Flying fish. There, are, there are fish with lungs, right? There's, a, there's this, the rudimentary lungs. They, they crawl, they crawl, they, uh, they crawl in the mud from one pond to the next. They have gills and they have lungs, but they exist. So our classification system seems to be a little arbitrary. And that goes for humans, too, when we classify humans into race, for instance. Race seems to be and is arbitrary uh, when we talk about uh, how things are organized and how we organize things. They've been done for a very long time by a group of quote-unquote experts, and most of the time... They were experts in the sense that they could find common characteristics and group them. But the groupings were pretty much an opinion based on knowledge that you gained because you worked your way up an apprenticeship system. And so usually if there was a mistake early on, there's always a mistake. It stays for a long time. All right? For instance, uh, Dr. Bill Platypus being a mammal. It is a mammal. It's called, we call it oviparous mammal. Because today we know there's numerous organs, or a couple organisms at least, that I can think of that give birth by egg, even though they're mammals. Right? There, uh, ostriches are an example of a bird that doesn't fly. Because, you know, if you ask a kid, you ask a, 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 a kindergartner, an elementary school student, what's a bird? A bird's something with feathers and flies. But a penguin doesn't fly. An ostrich doesn't fly. A penguin swims. So do you call it a fish? I had students... I've had students that, that thought that penguins were, I can't remember what they thought, but they, would, they did not believe that penguins were birds. They refused to believe it. I literally had to, I, I, it was like a whole lesson was dedicated to trying to prove that penguins are birds. Yeah? Is it because certain birds can't fly because No, it has, it has nothing to do with that. See, this, this is what, this is the problem with, with the way we educate you guys. We educate you in little compartments and and we, and we expect you to know your little compartment, and you learn it, you do good, because you're, you're smart, and so you learn your compartment, but then you, take, you go outside that compartment, you don't know what the heck is going on. So no, as the, uh, you've learned that there's these things that we call classifications, and mammals are mammals, right? And fish are fish, and birds are birds, and birds should be a certain way, they should have feathers. What happens if a bird doesn't have feathers? Oh, it's not a bird, okay. At one point, okay, you say it is a bird. She says it's not. So this classification system doesn't work that well. So let's take a look at this. When we talk about clades, we're talking about, uh, for example, birds, dinosaurs, crocodiles, birds. Right here. Uh, birds are here, sorry. Birds. Uh, uh, crocodiles are not here, but crocodiles and uh, dinosaurs all have a common ancestor, right? In fact, a lot of people say today, today we say that birds are dinosaurs. Right? So these are living or extinct. It doesn't matter if they're extinct or if they're alive. We can group them into a clade based on characteristics. How do we find characteristics of organisms that aren't around anymore? DNA. Fossils. It could be DNA. She's right. We do have some old DNA from old samples, but DNA only is, only works for things that are a few hundred thousand years old, maybe. Once we're in the dinosaurs, old dinosaurs, the big dinosaurs that died, 
We're talking about millions of years, so there's not a lot of DNA left that's usable, if any. Does that make sense? Say somebody say no? Okay. So when we're talking about classifying using DNA, and you're right, this excellent point, this we can use DNA to classify how similar one thing is to another, but you're limited is limited use for things that are more older than a couple than a, than a hundred thousand years or so. Even then, you're pushing it. All right. So, what similarities might? Well, mammals are have the unique homologous characteristic. Homologous means what? Same. same. Homo means same, right? Homologous hom homologous characteristic of producing milk. All mammals kind of pretty much they all produce milk. Do you think? It, do you honestly think it's all? Maybe So we call this character because of this characteristic, we call all mammals a clade. This is a clade. Now the cool thing about, about a clade is that we're not limited to by what some expert old man probably 100 years ago or 200 years ago in a basement of a natural history museum decided that it was a mammal and now we're stuck. It's a mammal. Right? The great thing, one of the great things about clades is they're based on evidence. What are the similarities between the organisms? And the more similar they are, the more what? The closer they are. The more similar two things are, the closer they are. And we don't classify their similarity based on just an opinion. Oh, they kind of look like each other. No, we have measurements. We measure things. We talk about qualities like feathers or skin, right? Uh, fur or feathers. There's a difference, and so we classify anything with a fur are probably closer together than things with the feathers. So we're going to, we're gonna, and this is all probability, right? We're going to put them closer together on that tree, right? If you have, if you have, a, if you have a, a chimpanzee and a human, and you have a bird, which are the two that you're going to put closer together? Chimpanzee and human. They have fingers, they, you know, they have a lot more similarities than with a bird. Where are you going to put a squid? That's way out there, right? A squid said they don't, have any, they don't even have bones. So it's not, they're not even vertebrate. They're, 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 you know what I'm saying? They're actually cephalopods, right? So here we have these like different classification systems, these different groups that we can group them, and we call each group that have a common ancestor a clade. The cool thing is that, so when we talk about mammals, mammals have this unique homologous characteristic, this, this characteristic that's common among mammals and very different from other creatures, that they produce milk. In fact, do you know where we get the name mammal from? Mom is a good idea. I see the mammary glands. Mammary glands are the glands that make milk, right? The mother, and somebody said mom, that's why I thought it was interesting because that's exactly what I mean, mom. Because what does mom do for the baby? Milk. Produces milk for the baby. And it's that mammary gland that we get the word mammal from. All mammals produce milk, theoretically. Well, see, that seems simple, it's easy. Yeah, that's a clade, very good. But how do we define mammals? How do, what were the four characteristics we said? Hair, warm-blooded, milk, and we call them homeotherms, by the way, versus heterotherms, but whatever. Live birth. Hold on a second. I got a problem with that. All right, you want to say has a vertebrae? Okay. Huh. So you're trying to tell me. You're trying to tell me that all that all mammal all mammals give live births. They have hair. They're warm blooded. That's not true. They, they, that's what you say. That's what you all said to me. I didn't say it. I didn't. No, I listed it. You guys told me. I didn't say it. What about this thing? It lays eggs. It is on cartoons, but it actually does give up, does lay eggs. It actually has a this duck little platypus has a, has a little barb on it, on its back on its back paw, I guess you call it. Has a little barb that's poisonous. Poison and barb. Catch, darn it. How do you how do you classify this thing? 
It has hair. It's warm blooded. It's poisonous. It's poisonous. It's poisonous. Okay, but I don't know how that. What it has to do with it? Goes it doesn't give my birth. It does. It does not. Does not. But we, you know what we do? We call this a mammal. We call this thing a mammal because it actually does give milk. It gives milk. And so what we found out through comparing more than just those four characteristics, right, looking at all kinds of other evidence, we're, it's pretty clear that a duck-billed platypus is a mammal. But somehow it changed dramatically from other mammals. Over time, yeah, we call it evolution. It's the process. So it's, it's a strange beastie, isn't it? I mean, seriously, it looks like, and in fact, the first, the first evidence of these, these were in America, in the Americas, they were sent back to England to those, those European men in the basement of the Naturist Museum, and those guys freaked out, they said, this isn't real, you're making this up. No, they're still around. I don't know. Yeah. What a great, that's another great question, isn't it? Maybe, maybe this mammal, maybe this beaver and a duck, they got together. Right? Right? And they had this thing, and then this thing ends up having an advantage. Shh. They had a tryst, and they had a baby, and the baby came out like this. No. I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to move on, though. You guys are killing me, though. I just want to point out you are killing me. There was an episode where he laid it. Okay, please be quiet. You're really out of control now. You get, I can't, you I don't know what else to say to you. I got to get moving. All right. So, Here's the problem with any of these class. For, let's look at another example. Jellyfish. Are they fish? Yes. 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 Why do we call them? Why do we call them? Je they're not fish. They're not fish at all. Okay. Okay, guys. Guys, you got to start reining this in. You're. Not, I know it's the end of the day, but you got to stop. Here's a question for you. Why do we call jellyfish jellyfish? Because people did what? They classified as a fish. Why did they classify as a fish? Because it swims. They say anything that swims in the water is a fish. But wait a minute. Why do you, have you ever read Moby Dick? Yes. All right. So those of you who read Moby Dick, it's a famous novel. It's about a whale. Wow. If I don't stop, if I don't get people cooperating, I'm just going to give you a right, written assignment because I don't know what else to do. And I hate that you're doing this while I'm recording this, but it's going to be what it is. Moby Dick is about a whale. What did they call the whale? Moby? A fish. Oh. <laughs> Why did they call it a fish? It's a whale. It's a big fish. A whale's a big fish, right? No. A, a whale is a mammal. A water is a mammal. I mean, it was. <laughs> a whale is a mammal, right? Yeah. It's not a fish. It has nothing to do with fish. But so we have real problems. So let's go down the list of what it is that we're, our classification system that was done by these old European men back before uh, the revolution, the, United, uh, the American Revolution, in the basement of natural history museums. What did they, they call everything that swam a fish? If it flew, what did they call it? Bird. And if, it, and if it had hair and gave live birth, it was a mammal. So, so far we have the duckbill platypus is a problem, right? We got the whale is a problem because it's not a fish and it swims. And does it walk? And she asked a really interesting question. She said, she said, do it. What? Because she said, it, uh, you know, a whale is a, ma uh, is a mammal. She said, does it walk? Interesting. Interesting question. Here's the, here's the answer to that. Hold on. The answer is, it has bones, it has, it has ankle bones. Why does a whale have ankle bones? Wait, hold on, I, I want you to write the question down. I want you to think about that. Why does a whale have ankle, a whale swims, why does it have ankle bones? That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. 
So now, we'll, hold on, I will get to it, I swear to you, we'll get to it. Maybe not today, but we'll get to the answer to that. In fact, you can have a whole little activity on the evolution of a whale. Really interesting stuff. It's, evolution can be complicated. So now, let's go and, and let's look at another example. Let's look at one more problem. Birds fly, you said. And fish swim, right? And fish have gills, right? But how do you explain fish to have lungs? There are fish that have lungs. They, they crawl from one pond to the next. Mud puppies, as they're called. Their name. It's not a fish, you say. It is classified as a fish, though. It also has gills. Duckbill platypus. So wait, I'm just listing all the problems with our system, right? That's all we're doing. It's looking at the problems. How do we, how do we make this work? So wait, I, I see your hand, but I just want to hold off a second. I want, to, I want to get the whole picture of the problem with this system, right? So we got whales are problems so far, right? Jellyfish aren't, jellyfish aren't really fish. Uh, whales aren't really, are not fish at all, they're mammals. Duckbill platypus, that, oh, wait, hold on. Duckbill platypus is, or platypi, however, whatever the plural is, are mammals, right? Even though they lay eggs. Whoa, I'm gonna get my, I'm my head spinning, right? I got fish that got lung, they have lungs, right? What other, uh, here's another example, ready? How about fish that fly? Or they glide from one pl one place. Like, there are yeah, they're beautiful. They're they're made. They don't technically fly. They glide, but you know, good enough. They they're in the air. They're not in the water, right? And what about uh, mammals that fly? And what about birds that don't fly, like penguins and ostriches and the kiwi? And we say and we say mammals give live birth. And mammals, we know mammals as, as organisms that have umbilical cords, right? They get if you've ever seen a dog or cat being born, you get I'll wait, because I, I know that I know the topic is interesting. I know we're finally getting into stuff that everybody's interested in, right? Because we've been talking about DNA and, and proteins and genes for so long. Now we're actually talking about stuff we like, right? This is what everybody wants studies biology wants to know about. Animals. Yes, but hold on a second. So here's my question. Well, how, do we, how do we justify all these exceptions? Is it really a rule if there's so many exceptions? No, no. no, it's not. It really doesn't make any sense. It seems like it's an arbitrary system. So this is why we get, we've come up with this new system of, of classifying animals and plants these any way we want. So that's an advantage. That's an advantage. I want you guys to, for homework to kind of look this up. Guess which one of these. And I don't want you to guess. I want you to go and do some research over the weekend and try to figure it out. Which one of these is most closely related to a bird? To a bird. There's a lot of guesses. Um, and that, it does say guess, but I'd, I'd rather it be an educated guess. If you can't find it on Google, if you can't find it anywhere on the internet, then I want you to go ahead and, uh, and guess and tell me why you think it is. So there's a tortoise, there's a lizard, write it down, crocodile, and so twar, twatara? Twatara? What is that? <laughs> this thing. So write it down. It does look like an iguana, I must say. But so there it is, and there it is, and there it is. These are the four. Which one of these four is most closely related to birds? What are you going to use to make that decision, by the way? Find the common characteristics between these things and birds. And which one is going to be the most closely related to birds? The one that shares what? The most characteristics. So don't just tell me. So I like the, the word guess is fun. And yeah, but I want you to make an educated guess. So just tell me alligators, that's interesting. But to say alligators and birds, then tell me what, what do alligators and birds share that you want to put them in the same in the same clay? Okay, but all four but they have to think about it though. Think about it. All four of these lay eggs, and so do birds. So it has to be what? In order to be the most closely related to birds, one of these shares more characteristics with birds than the others. So it has to be a, a new characteristic, a characteristic that birds and whatever, whichever one you decide here, share with birds, but not with the other three. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
So you have to you have to kind of take it easy and, and, and take a step back and think on that one. Why do you say to a terror? I'm talking about the traits, guys. The traits, not the names. Why do you say that? I need care. When you look it up, and I see some of, some people have already looked it up on their phones. When you look it up, I want to know the characteristics. I want to know what characteristic makes him more like the that one than the other three. Don't do it now. Do it called cladograms. Let me ask you this thing. Look at these four. In fact, write it down because I want this. Is I I thought at first I'll have you guess, but I think it's be, it's a better idea after we've done it a couple times in first uh, second period. And, Six, that you take this home as a question, and this is your homework for the weekend, you come up with an answer. Go do some research online. And which of these four, the tortoise, the crocodile, the lizard, and I cannot pronounce this, but I'll try. Tortara. Tortara. I'm trying to pronounce it in English. So Tortara, all right, these four, is it from El Salvador? But these four... I don't, I don't know what, and obviously it looks like a reptile of some kind. What, which one of these four is most closely related to birds? How are you going to tell that? What are you going to look at? Look for characteristics. Very good. Listen, listen to your colleague. Your colleague has hit it right on the nose, and I haven't even said it yet. It should have like three out of the four or two. So you should have, but I, so these four, which one of these four, you're going to make a choice, is closer to a bird. And she's saying, look at the characteristics. She's absolutely spot on. Look at the characteristics. But how are you going to tell which one, is, which one of these four is closest Ist to a bird? Well, wait. You say, we already said characteristics. So you have to say that which one of these four has characteristics more characteristics like a bird than the other three. You can look at anything. That's a good question. It's a great question. She asked, can we look at the habitat? You have to look at everything. You can look at what they eat, how they behave. I don't care. But you have to come up with a list of characteristics that show which one of these four is closest to a bird. There is an answer. You can look it up, and there is a why and know how for and what for. Yeah. No, no, no. No, this is her question. I'll let you say because I was about to say all right, go ahead. Have you ever heard, like, of a flying lizard? Yes. All these flying lizards and flying uh, squirrels and flying fish, they actually glide. I just want to make that a point. I mean, there are flying mammals. We call them bats, right? But, but flying squirrels are actually gliders. And um, so there's a lot of organ and flying fish are actually gliders. But, yes, they do exist. There are lizards that glide. Yes? Okay. No, you know, this is my point. It's not a stupid question. And in fact, people that think that that's a stupid question, right? People that think that that's a stupid question, they're not thinking as deeply as you are right now. I hate to say that that way, but I think that's true. So she asked the question, is a turkey a bird? And you might think, well, you know, it's just a quick look at that question. You might think that's a stupid question, right? Which is why you started the, you started the conversation with, don't think this is a stupid question, right? It's not a stupid question. Why would someone not think of a turkey? Why did I, let me, let me tell you this. I spent, I've been teaching for 22 years. 22 years. I just had to do this paperwork for, for the office and I was shocked. Even though I have to do it every year, I don't know why I'm shocked. But anyways, 22 years, I've gotten into discussions with students, I think, I want to say five times. Five times, five different years where I've literally spent an entire class time trying to prove that a penguin is a bird. It doesn't fly. And, and turkeys, people don't think turkeys fly, but they do fly, by the way. They, just don't, do, they don't do well. They do short distances. Oh, it is a bird. They're, oh, no, they're birds. But I'm trying to tell you that I had to sit there and argue and pull up evidence and list, make lists to prove that the penguin's a bird. But as frustrating as that was, as I, as I, as I matured, and this happened early on in my career, I realized it's not stupid. I'm the stupid one for assuming that they are birds. Why am I assuming they're birds? 
Why are we assuming that a turkey's a bird? Because we're saying it, it flies, it doesn't fly. Well, it does fly, but not very well. But we, because it has feathers, okay. What about a bird that doesn't have feathers? So we said that we said that mammals are. We said mammals are uh, have hair. Didn't we say that? Okay. But what about hairless cats? Are they mammals? You see why that question is not, not stupid, right? Because you can think of a bird as, okay, it's a bird. Just like they thought back in when they wrote Moby Dick, right? They thought the whale was a what? A big fish. They thought jellyfish were what? Fish. That's why they call them jellyfish. They're not fish. We'll, we'll talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to get off sidetrack. I want to focus on what we're trying to get to. I'm trying to make a point here. I'm hoping I make it. I hope I kill it here. So, yes, a turkey is a bird, and there's reasons why we call it a bird. But it doesn't have to be classified as that. The only reason we call it a bird is because some old European guy in the bottom of a natural history museum, probably in England, called it a bird because it had feathers. Okay? Yes. But we just saw the duckbill platypus, right? That, didn't, that freaked that guy out. When they brought it over from the Americas, after America was settled, and they, somebody found it in Florida somewhere, or wherever they find duckbill platypi, or whatever it is, they took the, they took a sample back to him, and he looked at it and said, "I this is a, this is fake. This is not somebody made this up. I cannot believe that this actually exists." So, what I'm trying to get at is what? Who can tell me what I'm trying to get? At? What is my point? Oh, I have a question. Kind of. Is there something up with a non-duckbill platypus? Because you keep on saying duckbill. Well, let's look at it. Let's, can I just show you why they call it duckbill platypus? Why does it? Why do you think they call it duckbill platypus? It looks like a duckbill. So, it, it, I know that in science everything seems complicated, but really, we just name it the way it look. I mean, if it if it's if it's has a duckbill, somebody says this is a duckbill platypus. Let's call it that. Or what? Why, why are penguins classified? That's a great question. Why do we call penguins birds? See, that's the question. I love that. See, see, to me, to me, that question and his question are turkeys birds actually shows more thinking than just saying they definitely are birds. Well, why are you calling penguins a bird? They have hair. Because somebody told you it was a bird. No, they don't have hair. They have feathers. Oh, you took those I didn't say they had hair. No, you said they were hairless. But do you see what I'm saying? So my my question for you though is here's here's the question. Why what is the point? What's the point of this? That this whole little mini discussion? So we can see how the code. So we're gonna spend the final Yeah, that why why that's right, you got it. That's the main purpose, how it connects. But my here's my question for you though. How what, what is my point with bringing up all these exceptions? That, like, the old way that we used to classify stuff is not good. That's right. It's broken, right? The way that Miss Miss Perez, the way that I learned how to classify things doesn't work. At least it doesn't do it well. We still use it because it's still useful. Just like we, I taught you before that Newton's laws of motion, or Newton's laws, uh, all the details, his formulas, well, they're wrong. Einstein proved him wrong. Those relationships aren't true. But they work. They're true here and now. They're just not true for big things or really small things, right? But they work for us. We can build buildings with it. We can shoot rockets to the moon with it. We're good. So they work, so we use them. So with the nomenclature, with this old Linnaeus and his old nomenclature, uh, uh, what we call Latin binomial nomenclature, two names, a genus and a species, that's the old way of doing it. In fact, I try not to spend too much time in it, on it because it's, it's not as useful as what you're about to learn. And by the way, the state exam has you learn what? Cladograms. It's extra credit. So there's three assumptions that we're making. There's three assumptions we're making. And you should write, these you should definitely write, definitely write down. Without a question, you need to know these three. Characteristics change over time. 
Thus, the amount of change can help determine relationships. So over time, groups of populations change their characteristics. They, they look different. Darwin's finches, uh, we'll take a look at them later, but what you see is they're all birds, but some, some of these birds have long, thin beaks, others short, stubby beaks, so the long, thin ones can go in and get, uh, like a hummingbird, get nectar out of flowers, where a short, stubby beak might be a seed cracker, somebody that, that a bird that cracks seeds, each one eating different foods. Yes, they're all in the same clade as, as birds, but then we can group them in smaller groups, smaller clades, based on what they eat and how they get there. So there's characteristics that change over time. And so this is going to be a key understanding that life changes, things change. They're de We've talked about the mechanisms of those changes, haven't we? Mutations, right, crossing over. Every time sex occurs in a, in a population, there's a mixing up of the genes. That produces something new, a new human being with new characteristics. Especially with mutation, you get characteristics that you maybe you've never seen before. So when you're talking about characteristics and changing over time, you're, you're we're going to be talking more about this. What natural selection pressures is it that determines how a whole population changes versus just an individual? So if your baby's born with six fingers on each hand, which happens, it's, a, it's actually a mutation that it does occur. And it could happen to your God, you know, I don't know if that's a good or bad. I don't know if it's functioning. You'd have to look that up. But... That is a, 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 an actual mutation. Six-fingered people do exist. Um, the question is, why doesn't the whole population, why hasn't the whole population become six-fingered? It seems like it would be an advantage, especially play the piano, right? Mm -hmm. Assuming it's a functional finger, why not six fingers? Like Something has stopped the six-fingered fingers, six finger gene from spreading in our population, right? And so that's the whole conversation we're going to have. But over time... Characteristics change. It kind of explains why some of us are lighter, lighter skinned, even though we all, if you're religious, you believe Adam and Eve. If you're a, biolo a biologist, you, you think of evolution. But it kind of explains how we can have all humans starting in East Africa, right? And then now, a few, what, 100,000 years later, something like that, we're here, here today, and we're not all the same, are we? We're different. So our mechanisms, the mechanisms that we studied already, meiosis and crossing over and, and, and mutations, they all contributed to this genetic variation which, made, which made, allows for change over time. So that's the first assumption. And there's a lot of evidence behind that assumption, but we'll go ahead and make that assumption. The next is groups of organisms are descended from a common ancestor. You have to understand that everything we're going to talk about is based on these three assumptions. So when we say mammals, what do we know about all mammals? They had a common ancestor. When we use the clade, when we define a clade as animals, right? Animals are a clade. What do we know about all animals? If they're a clade, they all came from a common ancestor. All birds came from a so anytime you define a clade, remember you're saying, what you're saying is there's a common ancestor somewhere on that big old tree. All right. Next, the last assumption is that there's a branching pattern to the evolution of species. And when, it's, when a split occurs, two distinct species eventuate. They become. Right? And that's called speciation. That's an important word, speciation. You create a new species when you collect enough differences in a population. How, mu how, mu how much difference does it take to make a new species? It's difficult to say. There's the easy way. There's the easy way to tell a species, right? In other words, you're definitely a different species if you can't mate and have a baby that can have babies, right? And we'll talk more about that later. But that's definitely two different species, right? A turtle and a horse can't have a baby. So we can say those two are definitely different species, right? We've got no problem with that. But, but it gets more complicated, right? There are species of birds that 
don't there are spe- uh, let's you know let's use humans as an example Neanderthal right cavemen Homo habilis, uh, humans, Homo sapien, who we are. Two different species, Neanderthal and Homo sapien, two different species. Do you know that, I think it's, I don't quote me on this percentage, but something like 3% of European DNA is Neanderthal DNA? What does that mean to you? What does that mean? What, think about what that means. Uh, the Homo sapien and the Neand- Homo neanderthal had babies. So, and that, and those babies stayed in the population. And today, they're still having babies. So, so those genes, because where did genes come from? Their parents, right? So, if we have Neanderthal genes in, in Homo sapien in humans, that means that these two species—we call them different species—that means they they could mate and have babies, right? So how do we define species? It's a collection of differences, and who decides when it's a species? Uh, we decide. Humans decide to call it a different species. So the ductal platypus? Say that again. Ductal platypus. The ductal platypus, yeah, where we classify ductal platypus is a good example. We classify it as a mammal, even though some characteristics are missing and some aren't. We do that because we decided to do that, right? Okay. So speciation, there's some hard lines. We know, for instance, as I said a minute ago, if two things can't have babies, they can have babies, right? Then we're sure we're pretty sure they're different species. A lion and a tiger. They can make a liger. They can make a creature that's half tiger, half lion. But but they cannot that liger is sterile. It can't have babies. And so, and by the way, ligers are pretty cool. They're really bigger than than tigers, but and they're just awesome. Yeah, look it up. Get your phone set up. There's uh, there's uh, a, 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 a a donkey and a horse can be can make a mule, and mules are sterile. Huh? A what? Uh, I'm not sure about ponies. I think they might just be a, a subset of, of horses, but you have to get back to you on that. I'm not sure. It's called the liger. They're giant. No, they're big. Yeah, they're that big. They're giant. But they can't have babies. And that's why we don't call. Them, that's why we call lions and tigers different species, right? Because they can have babies, but they can't. They, those babies can't have babies. They're sterile. That there is no dying off. There is no population. It, it can happen, but it's it's just not gonna. It's not sustainable. So once they die, they just die. There's no, There's no more. They can't have babies. I've seen one right. of All right. So that's the idea of speciation. We'll get back to it again. Really, let's focus on cladograms. So these are the three assumptions. Here's the three assumptions. And I hope by now, after months of work, I hope that you agree with most of these three. Part of the reason we spent so much time doing all the things we did is so that you can agree at least on these three things. The first, the first assumption, and it's, I hate the word assumption because it's not really an assumption, but then technically it is, I suppose. It's an assumption with evidence, okay? So we're making an assumption, but there's evidence behind it. So characteristics change over time, and thus the amount of change can help determine relationships. Was, can anybody tell me what they mean, what that means? Yeah, go ahead. I was like, well, the curve, they change over time with the health, the relationship, like, with the earth and what, what's going on. Like, no. Okay, no, that makes sense. But now, now, now that make, what you're saying is a possible way of reading that. But now take what you're reading and put it in the context of what we've been talking about. Right? Yeah, I want her to give it one more shot. Think about what you just said. You're right. Relationships according to what? Now, think about what we've been talking about. What have we been saying for the last... Yeah, to their families. I like it. I like family. I wouldn't use that word family. Their, but... who they around, like, right, right. I get you. I hear you saying you're almost there. Somebody else want to say it? Yeah. How things mutate and change over time. Uh, mutate and change over time. Yeah. Does what? To help determine what relationships. See, she's having trouble with this word, right? The what rela- She said family, which I like that word. That's right. You're right. I just want a little better, uh, a more depth, a, a little clearer. 
relationship. Okay, people. See, that's why I don't like necessarily species. family. Species. species. Between species. Relationships between species. How are you relate? How? What is the question I asked you to do for homework? Think about it. I asked you to do what for homework? Which of those four species are most closely related to birds? So, so when you're looking at how things have changed over time, we're looking at how closely are things related. So two things that are more closely related, would they have more differences or less differences? They have less differences. The closer they are related to one another, the less the differences between them. Does that make sense? So let me give you an example. If I take a fish from the back room and I put it in front of you, and I put a monkey in front of you, which one are you most closely related to? The monkey. Are we all closely? The monkey, because it has ten fingers and ten toes. Not really, you know, four, eight fingers and one, Hair. two thighs and you know, all that, but whatever. <laughs> At ten digits on, on, the, on, I don't know how do you say that anymore, but yeah. So ain't that evolution? Yes, you're right. This is all about evolution, right? This is about looking, first I need you to agree that you can tell, you can, I, I, if I can get you just to agree with me that an ape, a monkey, and a human, we are more closely related than, to each other than we are to a squid. Yes, we are. Why do you say that? Because we have some similarities, similarities, characteristics that similarities, the characteristics, the characteristics, right? that we compare show what? The, the relationships between the species. You're thinking about family, cousins, etc. But it's okay because you're close. I, that's why I said you were right. Because we are talking about that. But we're talking about between species, right? They are relationships. They're still relationships. They're just relationships that are further separated than cousins or, or brothers and sisters, right? So we're all good with that assumption. Nobody disagrees with that. Somebody want to disagree with that? No. Yes. So it's like it's related, but it's not. So is that why people don't really understand evolution? Yeah, it's a deep question. You're asking a deep question. There are a lot of people that take issue with evolution, especially the evolution of man. Some people can agree with evolution if you're talking about microbes or, or smaller organisms, but other people disagree. I don't want this to turn into a discussion about religion, okay? And so if you don't, your parents or, or your family or you don't believe in evolution, you don't have to believe in evolution, right? What did I tell you about science? I told you a lot about science, so it's a bad question. <laughs> what, have I told, what have I told you? Well, let me just say it again. Science, we, uh, what I hope you've gotten from so far from this class is that Everything in science, everything we teach you, we know is probably wrong. As I told you, not Newton's law is motion, right? I told you Einstein proved them wrong a long time ago. But they're still useful, so we still teach them. But the reason I say that we agree that we're, we're probably wrong is because we, in science, assume that we can't know the answer. All we can really do is collect enough evidence to support or to... To support our thesis, and we call it our theory, right? To support, we have a theory which has a lot of support, and we agree with it. Or we, we have evidence that, that takes away from the theory, and we dispose of that, of that theory. So that's all we do. And as time goes on, there's change. There's always changing of, of definitions and ideas. That's science. There's no, there, this is not religion, right? So what I want you to do is when we're talking about evolution, if it conflicts with your beliefs, is to take your religion hat off and just put your science hat and say, in this theory, how does this theory work? And even though I don't believe in it, I don't want you to believe in anything, I say, because belief to me is something that's separate from knowledge, right? And knowledge is something that we have in this evidence and we make this connection today and that can change tomorrow, right? Okay, so today we have this idea of evolution. It's, it's a strong theory. It has a lot of evidence behind it. And there's a lot of religious reasons why, and I don't want to get into it, right, that people disagree with it. But the evidence is clear, and I hope you agree with the first assumption, right, that over time things change, and the closer they are to one another, the more closely they are related to one another. 
Is that, is that make sense? Okay. Groups of organisms are descended from a common ancestor. Can you agree to that? Yes. So all humans came from a common ancestor. We talked about that, right? So we all came from East Africa, and we spread out. And by the way, as we spread out, what happened to us? We said we Our characteristics did what? Changed. Changed. So that explains why there's so many different people, so many different looking people over time, populations, because we've changed over time. So you see how that fits, right? When things start not to fit, what do we do in size? Try to make it fit. We try, but if we can't make it fit, like we did, with, we couldn't make mammals fit, right? We couldn't make fish fit. So find another way of doing it. Find another explanation. That's what we do in science. All right? So we're, I'm not up here preaching, right? This is not what I'm doing. I'm up here explaining our thought today. There is a branching pattern in the evolution of a species, right? As they split, in other words, the family tree idea that I was giving you earlier, they split, and when a split occurs, we get a new species. We'll t we'll, we'll, I'll explain that a little bit, but I'm just saying this. Here you have, you have a baby. That baby has six fingers. By the way, there are people with six fingers. That does happen. There is a gene that will give you six. It's a recessive trait. It'll give you six fingers. If that baby is more successful than other babies, that gene will spread over time. Maybe there's a whole group of people, a whole population with six fingers. At some point, we're going to call it a different species. Right? At some point. Who knows when? Who decides if it's a different species or, or not? We do. We do. So species, when I was young, species was easy. If, they had, if, you were, if two creatures were able to mate and have babies that could have babies, we called that a species. So two horses can get, have together, have a horse baby that can have horse babies. What do we call that? Horse a horse species. Two donkeys can get together and have and donkey babies that can have donkey babies. We call that a donkey, donkey species. But if you took a donkey and a horse and you combined them into a mule... That's what they are. That's what mules are. It's a horse and a donkey having a baby. Those mules are sterile. They're sterile. They can't have babies. No. That's why we say those two are not the same species. See, that's easy, isn't it? Here's another example. Lions and tigers are different species. The reason that lions and tigers are different species is that when they have babies, and they can have babies, they, pr they produce a liger. <laughs> look it up. Take your phones. Take your phones out. Look it up. Yeah. They're they're both. They're both guys. Uh, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen. Hello. Hi. So. Ligers are very large, yeah. uh, very large, and they're, they are a cross between, I know, they are a cross between a uh, tiger and a lion, but they're sterile. They're bigger than, and this is blurry, but they're bigger than a tiger or a lion. Uh, they can't have babies. Because they were a product of two creatures that were not, they were what? Different species. So what if the, wait, 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 what if they, a male and a female, what if they? Male, female ligers will not produce, there's not, there's nothing, this creature is sterile. So that's why they It can't have babies. It does not have sperm or eggs. If it's a girl, it doesn't have eggs. If it has, a, if it's a boy, it doesn't have sperm. If it has a sperm or the eggs, it can't, you gotta listen. If it has sperm or eggs, it can't reproduce for whatever reason. Too many chromosomes, too few chromosomes. Remember we talked about that? Yes. Just like people with Kleinfelder syndrome, they can't have babies, right? They're sterile. Why? They have too many chromosomes. These, these ligers are in the same position. Wait. So you yep. talk about, you know, like, you see on the dog, and, like, they're very big, like, out of the ordinary. If something happens, they just, they can't. Now, this is the genes. You can breed dogs into getting bigger and bigger dogs. They does, there are consequences to that. Yeah? What if two like, species, different species have 
highlight in some way highlight um almost the same chromosomes, but like maybe one pair is like different. There are a lot of things we can do and consider, a lot of different situations that can happen. So, for instance, I'll give you an example, a human example, if I can, of uh, this situation. So far, I'll give, can I just get back to that specific question? Because I want to give you another example first. So a tiger, tiger and lion, they have a baby that's sterile. Can be, so two different species. That's easy to tell, right? Uh, a turtle and a tiger. Two different species, right? They're not going to have babies, do you agree? Right? I mean, I mean, come on, guys. We can agree on that, right? Okay. Hold on to your question. Hold on to it. Write it down. So here's what I'm saying to you. What about... I see, I lost my train of thought. So tiger and a lion knows... Okay, what about Neanderthal, cavemen? And Homo sapien. Homo sapien. You. Not the monkey. You. You're a Homo sapien. Are they human? They differ from us, though. They kind of dangerous. from us, though. They are. Not kind of. They are. They're different species. They're. We consider Neanderthal a different species. Shh. Shh. Try. Let's pretend like I know what I'm talking about. Neanderthal. It's pronounced Neanderthal. Because it's not an English word. Okay? So Neanderthal, even though it's spelled with a TH, Neanderthal is a different species. But did you know that about, don't quote me on a percentage, but about 3% of humans from Europe have Neanderthal genes in that? What does that suggest to you? They weren't, they weren't sterile. So wait a minute, we're calling them different species, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you should be. Uh, we're calling them two different species, but they had babies that obviously had babies, right? Because yeah. they're, they're, they're part of us now, aren't they? Yeah. Why do we call them different species? All right. Have I confused you enough now? Yes. I have questions. All right. So here's here's the answer. Yeah. Is it a gene that allows? No. It has to do. It's complicated. Chromosome number, genes, yes, as well. But here's the thing. When we call it a new species. It's all about measuring the differences between the groups. If you have some number of differences between two groups, we generally can call them different species. Even though they might be able to have babies together, we can call them different species if they're different enough. If there's enough differences in characteristics. Does that make sense? Yeah. So even though they're, even though humans and, ne and Neanderthal, Homo sapiens and Neanderthals have babies and they're part of our gene pool now, we're going to call them different species because there was enough differences. And what is enough? We decide that. We're calling. We're the ones doing the classification, right? Yeah. So we get to make that choice. So we're going to call it different species because there's large enough differences. So it's complicated. The simple definition, if somebody asks you on a test, the simple definition of a species is the difference is between one and two. The difference that is that if they if they can have ba if they can, if they can have babies with other with each other and have those babies can have babies, fertile offspring, right? Mm -hmm. Then we're gonna call them the same species. That's a very simplistic definition. Yeah. All right, so here we have a cladogram, as we discussed in, uh, on Friday. We have these, uh, the shark, the fish, the, the frog, the monkey, the rabbit, or hare. They call, uh, well, it's a hare or rabbit, but the hare is their characteristic. Then the alligator or crocodile, not sure which, and then a bird, another bird, or a bird. All right, so each of these 
we would normally remember Linnaeus, and hopefully you watched the previous video from Monday, and when the day I was absent, and you really understand the idea that Linnaeus, the old Latin binomial system isn't working, right? And that's because we need something that's more versatile, something that reflects evolution better. The connect, and if you don't want to say evolution, the connection between organisms better, right? The relationship between individual species better. Does that make sense? And so when we say this is a fish, then you have to ask, are these two, then they're both fish. And if they're both fish, then there's not really a lot of differences. But we know fundamentally there's a big difference between this fish and this fish, right? Uh, so, and in fact, you can see that this fish is much more closely related to us than the shark. And it has to do with the fact that they have bones, a bony skeleton. We have bony skeletons. We, our ancestors all... We had this common ancestor, right, with fish. We had this common ancestor with shark. What was the common characteristic that evolved during the natural history that allowed, that, that makes, connects us all, connects all these organisms? The vertebra. the vertebra. All these organisms have vertebrae. As you know, not all organisms have vertebra, right? So we know like jellyfish and squids, they don't have bones at all, but they also don't have a vertebrae. Even though this thing here, this shark, doesn't have any bones, it does have a vertebrae. It has a back. has a back. has a, you know, a little, has a nerve that runs all the way back to the brain, right? Mm -hmm. It's a spinal cord. So this vertebrae exists in sharks, but it's not made of bone. It's made of cartilage, where all the rest of these have bones. So each of these, this is how we can organize organisms into clades, right? Now, what if I wanted to make a clade of everything that had hair? What if that's the one, that's the characteristic I'm interested in? I want everything that has hair, because if it has hair, I'm going to say they're, they're related. Right, I would have to circle what? I would circle, if I were going to make a circle, I'd circle this thing, right? These two. That's my clade. They have what common ancestor? This common ancestor right there that, that had hair. Does that make sense? So if I, if I look at, uh, let's see, what about four limbs? That's a big deal, isn't it? Yeah. Having four limbs versus like six for insects or eight for arachnids, right? These th Somewhere along the line, arachnids developed eight legs and and. and uh, and uh, uh, arachnids are spiders. Uh, so, and insects had developed six legs, right? Centipedes, a hundred legs, centipede, right? Millipedes, a thousand legs, although I don't really think it's a thousand, but you know, they have a lot of legs. Wh where we are, have how many legs? Or how many limbs? Four. Four. And we share that common characteristic with all these organisms up here. What would we call this, us four limbed, or we call it tetrapods? Right? Tetrapods. That's a, that could be a clade. Where, where, what clade would I circle here on this, on this, uh, on this cladogram? Starting with the frog, right? Let me make this a little smaller. Stalling, s starting with the frog and kind of going over to the crocodile, all of these have what common characteristic? It has, it has four limbs. The wings are limbs, right? In fact, when I show you the skeleton underneath, this is really, really super interesting. When you look at the bones of a bird wing, they actually have five fingers. Their skeleton is very much like ours. The only difference is that their fingers are longer. Some of their fingers are longer than other fingers. So this, yeah, and so that they can form that shape of a wing. But they're actually, their hands, they're, they have hands very, very similar. I mean, their skeletons are very similar to our skeletons. So when you look at the skeletons of all four of these, all five of these, you can include humans in that. The skeleton of a frog is very similar to the skeleton of a human or bird or a crocodile. Of course, there are differences. But the interesting thing is that we have, all have four limbs and our limbs are very similar. Of course, four limbs is even uh, earlier than having uh, five fingers, but birds are very similar to us.
All right, so let's go on. And, there, and by the way, this is all based on, four, on three assumptions. The three assumptions that you have to memorize, right? Characteristics change over time, thus the amount of change can help determine the relationships. What does that mean? That means to us that if you see something that's very, very different, then we assume that they're not as related to something that's much, much more similar. Now, we say things like that all the time. I see someone with, that looks like me, especially if they're, if they're, you know, I have a cousin that looks like me. People wonder, well, these two guys are obviously related. That's what we say, right? Two people look like each other. Are you guys cousins? Are you guys sisters? This is a natural phenomenon, right? It's, na it's a logic that we all agree with. If two things look very much alike, then we kind of want to group them together as being related. Is that okay? Yeah. No. Yes? yes? What's the no? Why not? You can look like, you can look similar to somebody. But you are related. If you look like a human, you look like someone, you know you're related. You may not be cousins or brothers or sisters, but you know you're related, right? You're all human. You all know where we all came from. Even, I don't care if you believe in Adam and Eve or you think that science, evolution is, this, is a solution. Whatever you want, right, to think of, the bottom line is, what do we know about all humans? That we're all related, right? Right? I mean, is that hard to understand? Is that hard? No matter how you look at it, right? I don't care if you look at it biblically or you look at it scientifically. We all agree we're all related as human beings. Is that true or not? Yes, true. Why? Because we look like each other. We share traits, right? Why, don't you, why do you not look at a dog or a rabbit or a bird and say, hey, I'm, I'm more closely related to, to that than I am to, to, to this other person? Why not? Why don't you do that? Because the they look a lot different. Does that make sense? Yes. They have feathers. We don't. We have hair. They don't. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So there are characters. It's those characters that make the difference is the point I'm trying to make. Huh? Am I making sense to you? Mm -hmm. All right. So when we're looking at characteristics change over time, that helps us determine the relationships, right? So we're assuming that we're, this is an assumption, and it's a good one based on, it's, the assumption is based on facts. It's not an assumption that we're making a wild guess. It's not a wild guess. This is a lot of fossil evidence that we're going to go into, and you went over some of it yesterday, and you'll go over more of it throughout the week, okay? There's plenty of evidence that kind of, su that supports this assumption. A lot of evidence. Overwhelming evidence. So there are real similarities between organisms, and the more closely we're related to each other, the more, uh, the more characteristics we share. That's kind of what this is based on, yes? But we're assuming that these characteristics have changed over time. We're assuming that there was an organism that was the, uh, a common ancestor to all things with four legs or four limbs, right? There's something with a common ancestor to all things that have lungs. Am I making sense? All right. Uh, is there something you guys want to say back there? I would love it if you just asked me the question. It's great. I'm glad you're asking that question. I know it happened. in a big lecture hall in college, you'll do that. As long as you're quiet, you won't get in trouble. But in this classroom this size, you can raise your hand and ask that question because that's a perfect question to ask. Because I bet you there's other people that missed it. What I'm saying is that as the characteristics, the more characteristics have changed, the less we think they're related to one another. Or the more, how, another way of saying it is the more similar the characteristics, the closer the relationship between the two things. Does that make sense? If two people look identical, we kind of assume that they're related, don't we? If they're not, if they're not related, it surprises us. Why is this then? Why is this statement so controversial? You know, why is this? Why is this a statement that 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 people get confused about? You might say, well. How do you know characteristics change over time? Well, that gone it. You know you don't look exactly like your parents, don't you? Right? Yeah. How is it that you could that your then how is it that your sister could end up looking or your daughter could end up looking exactly like your mom, but you don't look like your mom at all? My my niece was born 
I'm going to pause this because I don't want to embarrass certain people. So when we're talking about when we're talking about this concept, right, where these where people two people that are, look alike or think two creatures that share similar characteristics, we know that we know characteristics change over time. We've t we've discussed it. We've studied it, right? We know that uh, that for instance. Uh, homozygous, uh, that recessive traits can skip generations, right? My niece was born, my uh, brother doesn't look like my mother much at all, but my, his daughter looks exactly like my mother. Doesn't look like her mother or her father very much, I mean there's some similarities, but looks exactly like my mom when she was a baby and looks very similar to my mom right now. So when we look at, at characteristics of things that look alike, we, we know that things, the characters of a, of, of, of a species can change and do change over time. And we have measurable evidence to that effect. And you know this is almost common sense, right? It's virtually common sense that things change over time. Yeah? So like the lizard you showed yesterday on the video, how they said that it's not a snake because it's sentient. Exactly, exactly. And I'm going to show you more. You're going to do some activities this week, activities. I won't be lecturing to you, right? But there'll be some activities where you're going to look at these similarities. And you're going to wonder, why does a whale have a foot bone? It has a bone. What? Whales have feet. They have little tiny, little tiny leftover, what we call, uh, we'll, we'll talk about it later. But well, I'll tell you the term later. They have tiny little feet. How many of them do they have? They have four limbs, but they're not, the, the reason is, this concept that characteristics change over time, and the more common the characteristics, the closer related we feel that we are to one another. One of the reasons we, we classify whales as, as mammals is because of their skeletal structure. This very different from fish. It's not just that they breathe air, and not they, that they take in air, the gas form of, of, of oxygen, not the not the oxygen dissolved in water, right? So anyways, these characters just change over time, and I hope by the end of this, and yes, yes, yesterday's example of the lizard, and those of you that haven't watched the video, hopefully you'll watch it before tomorrow, because it, it'll make it easier for you to understand what we're talking about, is you saw a, a lizard that looks exactly like a snake to anybody just looks at it. It, well, it certainly does, but if you look close enough, you get a, you know, a magnifying glass out, and you look at the structure of its skeleton, You'll notice it has tiny little limbs that are kind of very vestigial. We call the word, the word is vestigial. But real tiny little limbs in its skeletal structure doesn't have on the outside. You can't see it. Just like whales have tiny little feet. It does, its jaw is not mobile. So it's actually its jaw is more like a lizard. And it has, it has tiny little uh, uh, leg or limb bones. And its eyes were infused. And because of that, we know it was probably close, more closely related to what? A lizard than a snake. And this is kind of what I've been talking about with humans and race, right? That we look at just a couple characteristics that can be confusing. This is why in science we, we look at the whole package. We look at DNA. We look at... This is why I'm telling you don't classify things just by the quick glance. What is the old saying? Don't judge a book by its cover, right? Read the book. Look inside before you make that decision what kind of book it is. So you have to look at, the, at something deeply and really understand it before you can start to to classify it. And this is why this system is so much better. All right. Groups of organisms are descended from a common ancestor. This is a big assumption, and this is controversial, right? Some people would argue, and you may have people in your own lives that argue this is not true, and this is a Satan's work, or whatever people say. This is not, this is kind of, if we, once the, the, the evidence is overwhelming. The evidence is it's almost hard to ignore it. It's like saying the sun doesn't rise in the east when we, it it seems to be something that happens every you know it it, it happens. It's like the, saying the earth doesn't go around the sun. We we're kind of sure it does. I know there's people out there that say that the earth is flat, right? Yes, my dad. So people there because of some celebrities saying that. I understand that people say that, and I'm not making fun of anybody that says it, but it's it's. It's kind of, it's Shaq, and those guys are saying it. it. Here's the thing. There's so much evidence to, it says that it's round. It's kind of hard to argue that it's flat if you're using logic and facts. Be, they, 
Look, it's conspiracy theories. It's conspiracy theories. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, you can travel around the world, right? You can fly around the world. We, we've done it. So if it was flat, there would be an end. So, so I could understand back, uh, you know, several hundred years ago, people might think that. But today, I just, there's no cause. But I just want to point out, my friends, listen, listen to what I'm saying to you. I want to point out that there's a lot of things that people believe or, or think that are not based in facts, they kind of end up being not supported by the data, not supported by the evidence. And as in science, and what you believe at home, guys, you want to think the earth is flat, that's fine. I'm not making, no, no, I'm not making fun of anybody. You want to believe that, that organisms don't have common ancestors? Please, I'm not telling you you have to believe anything different. But what I am saying is that in a science classroom, right, where we're base, basing our decisions on logic and facts, then you have to, this is evidence that just is overwhelming. We all accept it. It's an accepted assumption. Obviously, nobody's traveled in time and went back to the origins of life and followed it through, right? No one's ever done that. We can't do that. If we could, we would. But we can't, right? So we have to base our ideas on facts. So that's number two. Number three... There's a branching pattern in the evolutionary of, uh, evolution of species. And when, and when a split occurs, we call this speciation. And that's the, that's the question that everybody always asks. Like, if we're related to apes, how come, how come apes are still around then? If we inherit, if, if, we, if dinosaurs were here, uh, you know, uh, if, dinos if somehow we're related to these things, why isn't that organism still around? Well... It's kind, of, it's kind of this idea of speciation. That doesn't go, that species doesn't necessarily go away, but, but it, it may not have evolved. Like, for instance, and I'm going to say this. Let's say that a new, you've all watched X-Men, right? Yeah. Most of you. Okay, but you, you know the, you understand the concept of it. No. Okay. Why do I ask questions like this? I need to learn from my lawyer friends and just don't ask questions I don't know the answer to, right? Okay, so here's the, here's the thing. In the idea of the X-Men Marvel comics, you have a group of humans that some uh, humans, everybody's, we're all related to one another, that a mutation happens because of whatever reason, a bunch of mutations happens in our species, and this mutation gives these, uh, these people, these individuals, extra powers, whatever those are. Absolutely ridiculous. I mean, wrong on so many levels, it's not even funny. Wait, shh. That's it. However, it's, it, there is an advantage to this story, and that's this, under, this one little aspect of it that's interesting and that we can apply here. The X-Men idea is, is, is stupid on many, many levels, of course, but it's a fantasy comic book, right? Okay. So let's not think like you're going to be able to get x-ray eyes if someday if you keep evolving or whatever, right? That's not how it works. However, what I am going to say is this. In the X, think about this. In the X-Men, humans are here, yes? And then there's an evolutionary step, and you got these, these X-Men, right? But the humans are still here. So you can have both existing at the same time. And one group can go in one direction, and the other group in the other direction. And over time, both groups could be there, or what could happen to one of the groups? They could die off. So whether the creatures are still here or not is not, a, is not a factor of deciding how closely related they are, or are they the, the ancestor, are these species, the ancestors of this other species. And when I say ancestors, I don't mean like, oh, you're my ancestor. That wouldn't make sense, right? What I, what I mean is that your great, 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 whatever ancestor was my great, 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 whatever ancestor. And we can look at fish and say that. We can look at tr uh, trees and say that. It's just the, the more different they are from us, the what? That's really, so what does that mean? So I, I, I have several conversations going on, some of them about grading. I'm sorry to hear that. I'm, don't, I really would like not to hear you complain about not understanding something, though. That will someday really 
be a, a, a surprise to me if we could get people to actually not complain. Yeah, someone. It could be anything, right? So the, 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 the family tree, uh, remember, these are branching systems, and ideally, right, we are all, all these branches came from one, one type, one organism way back when, right? So when we say, when someone tells you, well, here you are, and here's uh, like chimps, let's say chimps, well, what what we say is that there was a that chimps have a, have an ancient we have an ancient common ancestor with chimps. We don't say we are re, no one ever said that we re, we descended from monkeys. That's ridiculous. In fact, monkeys are all the way over here. We are our family. We they have a long tail, right? No one ever said that. No. No one. No. No. No, that what they've always said. Now people don't listen. People misinterpret, and maybe somebody did say it because they misunderstood themselves. But Darwin, no one ever argued that we descended from apes or monkeys. What we argued is, what people have argued is that there is a common ancestor. That the physical part that makes us who we are came from some ancestor. Right, the, our ten fingers, you know, five feet, two, four limbs, right? Hair, all the characteristics that we we share with these with these guys called chimps, these that are chimpanzees. There's this common ancestor that we share these characteristics with. If, if this common ancestor were still alive, we could point to it, and say, okay, there, this is where we came from, this creature. But this creature, whatever it is, is gone. All right. It's gone. It, they they didn't. They were not able to survive natural selection. Time is as as taken them away, uh, just like time might take us away as a species. Right? Uh, it can happen. Uh, well, it, as long as we keep doing what we're doing to the earth, that's a real possibility. Nuclear holocaust. Right? There's a lot of things that could take us out as a species. The flu. The Spanish flu took out a third, killed millions, not thousands. This year is the worst flu we've seen in 10 years. Healthy women and children are dying from the flu, not someone who was sick and then got the flu and died. Wait, so men are dying from it either? Men as well, but we haven't seen it. No. I, I, don't know, I haven't gone over the data. I'm only referencing news articles that I've read, and the news articles I've read were women, healthy women and, and healthy children. I have not read a news article about a healthy man dying from it, but I'm sure that's happened as well. Okay, I haven't looked at the data. The story that, that hits the news is the stuff that shocks people. In this case, it was a mother, a healthy mother who just who had a baby who died, and then, of course that makes headlines, right? So, anyways, whatever happens, it doesn't. We're not guaranteed to still be here over time, right? We have to work at it. We have to struggle. We have to we have to uh, try to avoid our demise, right? We have to do things cognitively, intellectually, and make decisions that that allow our children's children's children to survive. If we don't do that, they may not, and that's something that we have to think about. So when this is not something that is, I'm not saying to you that we have to not survive, but the dinosaurs ruled this planet. For millions of years, it was the, the primary form of life on this planet was dinosaurs, besides, of course, bacteria and, and plants. But we're talking about dinosaurs ruled the earth. Something happened, and they no longer rule the earth. Yes, birds are still here. They're everywhere. But we're killing them off, too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's not a monkey. That's something that looks like a monkey. That common ancestor. That when you look at the Natural History Museum, you read the details, right? Don't look at just the picture. Read the details. And you'll see that, yeah, we had an ancestor's fur, you know, hair all over, probably walked a lot like a chimpanzee, right? But maybe had a little bit different hip. Or maybe the backbone was just a little different, right? And over time, what was that? Organi now you know chimpanzees can walk on their two on their behind, on their back limbs, right? You know gorillas can too. 
but they can't do it for a long time because their bones, their, their skeletal structure is not designed that way. And over time, the, the, there's small changes happen. These aren't big changes. It's not like in the X-Men. That's the problem with the X-Men. One day you're normal, then your baby's like this super different individual. There are very small changes that happen over time that accumulate into a new species, right? And so you, what you see in the Natural History Museum is something that walks on all fours and maybe something that walks on their, on their back legs more often than not. And then something has little less hairs walking upright most of the time. Then the skulls start getting bigger. And because the brain cavity gets bigger, probably because we started to eat more protein, whether that be meat or soybeans or whatever, and our brains start getting bigger and bigger. And so our skull's size, the bone, has to get bigger in response. And then what happens is that because there's more space, more bone size, our jaws have to get smaller. And I, and you know why? Have you ever thought of, the, uh, uh, have you ever thought of this? Why is it that we have to have our wisdom teeth removed? Right, but why do we have teeth that we, that we don't use? Do you ever ask that question? Nap is with everybody, all humans. Most of us have to have our wisdom teeth removed when we turn 18 because there's too many teeth for the size of our jaw. So what does that suggest to you? Have we always been that way? Have there been dentists? Did the caveman have a, cave, a certain cave that was like the dentist shop? No, that's, that would be kind of cool, but that's not how it happened. How is it that the cavemen could survive with this number of teeth, but all of a sudden we have real problems? And we have to have dentists remove, we have people that remove our teeth. Otherwise our teeth get all kinds of crooked and, and, and distraught. We get cavities and all these other issues. Why do we have all these extra teeth in our mouths? Exactly, their jaws were bigger, right? And why were their jaws bigger? Because their skulls were smaller. We could look. We have, uh, if we go to the Natural History Museum, I wish, I wish uh, one of the most magical moments in my life was when I took my nephew to the Natural History Museum and I, I had a professor that was that still there, Dr. Hannibal. It's interesting. His name's Dr. Hannibal and he, he does research in skulls. It's kind of crazy. All right, so anyways, he's an anthropologist. And, or, I believe he's an anthropologist. I don't know. But anyways, we went over there. He saw us, and he said, come on over. And he took us behind, behind the scenes, behind the curtain. And there was this room with shelves and shelves and shelves of bones. I, I don't know if they were actual bones or they were models of bones or whatever. And he, had, he let my nephew crawl through the skulls, like human skulls. Wait, that was clean? Of course. Crawl. Oh, my God. Like, you know, go through. Oh. Not like, not like crawl through. Like, okay. hey, here's here, here's my nephew, like eight years old, looking, picking up and looking at all these human skulls. And they're all different. And what we do is, you can see the difference, right? As you go further and further back in time, this the the cavity, the brain cavity, the skull, this part of the skull gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And what what do you think happens to the jaw? It gets bigger, it gets bigger and bigger. So there, there's that assumption. You see that as an example for the assumption number one. Over time, there's evidence of change in the skeletal structure of our ancestors. Right? How do we, why do we call them our ancestors? Because we have similarities with them. Okay? We look at them and we can see all the skeletal structures are the same, except their, their skulls are bigger and are, are, are smaller and their jaws are bigger. So there's there for them our number of teeth is fine, but then all of a sudden, all of a sudden our jaws get smaller because it has to because our, our brains got bigger, but now there's not as an, as many as much room for the teeth that we have. Walking, here's another example. Walking on two legs. Everybody agrees that humans do this, right? Yes. Interestingly, almost every human being on the planet is going to have back problems as they get older. If we were designed to walk on our two feet, why is it every human being has back problems? And women have more back problems than men because what happens is that the pelvic bone of a woman is bigger. That's, that's why women tend to have uh, wider hips, right? And that's the reason the pelvic bone tends to be bigger is so that why? 
so they can give birth easier, right? Because the last thing you want to do is to try to get a baby's head through a small bone cavity, because then you have to break the bone to get, like, the, that's how, by the way, they used to have to do that for small women, right? So you got a big head and a small pelvic, uh, small pelvic bone ca uh, opening. Uh, how, how's that going to go? Right? Very painful. That's right. And so that's, that's, an, that's a real issue. So, so that makes sense that the woman's uh, pelvic bone gets wider as we go. Now, when we were, in, when you look at the bones of our ancestors, well, we, in, in what science says is our ancestors, right? We can see that their bones, their, their structures were meant to walk on our four, all fours. We as humans are kind of in between. We can't really walk on all fours comfortably, but we know over time we were not designed to walk on two legs either. And I'm going to show you some videos, some data from a PowerPoint presentation from an anthropologist at the Naturalistic Museum who studies the evolution of walking. And we're going to look at how things walk and why is it different? Why is it humans have back? Almost every human has back problems and women have more back, are going to have more, are destined to have more back problems than men. Wait, I have a question. Yeah. I heard that the bigger your boobs are, the more black that's part of the problem. That's true. That the, the more mass you have on top, and the fatter you are, like I'm fat, right? The bigger you are on top, the more problems you're going to have with your back, right? I'm a fat guy. I can tell you that's true. Okay? As you walk around, your back, you're, you know, you're carrying a lot more mass. But it's really not about, I'm telling you right now, it's not about being heavy. It's not about having large breasts. It's about... The, our bone structure, and that we were that we are in the middle of changing from four legs to two leg walking. So there's very few creatures walk on two legs. You understand that? Very few. Think about it. How many creatures can you name that walk on two legs? Maybe ostrich, Bird. us. Bird, birds kind of hop. Birds kind of hop. They don't really walk. You ever see they walk? Penguins kind of waddle, right? Penguins, uh, but you know the. Uh, an ostrich actually runs pretty quick, so I'll go with that. Flamingos, they kind of, I guess they kind of walk, but they're more kind of like, do it. Kinda, it is a walk. I'll give you a walk. I'll give you flamingos. We'll go, but they're very few, right? Almost everything else walks on all four. Why? Because it's better for your back. Because that's how, that's how the vertebrae were designed. If we look at the common characteristics of the vertebrates, our vertebrae are designed to be at, for us walking on four. We have, not designed, I, I hate to use the word designed, but we, it evolved that way. And now a few, of, a few species, like humans, right, have evolved to walk on two legs. But there's very few creatures on this planet that walk on two legs. So if we walked on fours, we wouldn't have as many back problems? It, not us, not with our skeletal structure. Uh -oh. But if we had a skeletal structure like some of our, like a chimpanzee or, or an ape, they have a lot less back problems than we do because of the way they, their skeletal structures has evolved. Our skeletal structures evolved to such a way that it gives us an advantage to being standing upright, gives you an advantage. That's why dogs kind of respect us a little more because anything that looks big to other creatures, you kind of give them some space. And if you're tall, compared to them, it's all about eye contact, right? If you're tall, they kind of respect you more. Does that make sense? A lion, have you ever seen how big a lion is? You're not bigger than a lion. Very few people are taller than a lion. Lions, li especially the male lions, but it's true female lions too. When you go to the Naturalist Museum, you'll see a lion face up. It's, you don't really understand it until you see them face to face. They're, almost as, they're at the, almost the same height as you, and they're standing on all four. All right? On their, basically, on all fours, they are almost as tall as you are, and they have more muscle, and they're predators. Right? Remember, predators, lions are used to taking down. Uh, we, have, we, have, we have images of lions and tigers trying to take down elephants. Right? They're, these are predators. They're, they're, they're primary, you know, they're apex predators. They're in the, in the savannah, there's nothing that they don't try to take down. So when you talk, that's a little bit of an exception, right? But in the animal kingdom, in general, the bigger, hey, I'll tell you what. Some of these big guys, uh, you know, some of these big tall guys come at me. I'm like, hey, whatever, you know. You kind of give people a little bit of space when they're big because 
they could probably hurt you. So that was the point is that that through evolution what we know is that through evolution what we know is that the characteristics change over time. And we have this branching pattern. We also assume that there's this idea of speciation. That every time there's a branch, a new species develops. That doesn't say that they're gone, that the old one's gone. It could, that old one could pass. For instance, alligators. They've been here for a very long time. They were here with the dinosaurs. Uh, crocodiles and alligators, they were here a very long time. But, and they're still here. Jellyfish were here before the dinosaur. They're still here. Squids, sharks, ancient organisms as a species, right? There's not a shark that was swimming around with the dinosaurs. Yeah, I remember T-Rex. No, there's, no, nothing, uh, there's nothing around that was around with the dinosaurs, but their, their lineage is that old, right, as a species. Uh, these traits that uh, tie the clades together like vertebra, right, like four limbs, that we just created, those, tr those clades a minute ago, right? They're called derived tra characters or derived traits. Are we good with this? Yeah. And it should be pretty straightforward, but it's one of those things you have to, you really have to write down and study, put on vocabulary cards, know what a derived character is, know what a derived trait is. A derived trait is something that, that evolved, derived, it came, it came into being. It wasn't there before, but everything after has it, okay? It's a derived true character. So the derived characters are the animals, and the derived traits are the real No, derived traits or characters are synonymous. They're, same, they're the same thing. Derived traits or characters are these traits or these characters that, that, came, they're, that came into being. The example that I used a minute ago was vertebra, right? Or four limbs, right? You see, remember how I circled everything with four limbs? Do you remember that? Because some of you are staring at me just kind of like, it's just staring. I don't, I'm not talking for, come on guys, let's break, wake up those little brains of yours. Mine's still asleep, that's why. I, I think, I know your brain shrinks as you get older, but I feel like mine shrunk, is shrinking faster than everybody else's. That's how I feel some days, you know. So, yeah, it does. So you better make sure it gets big now because you need it, you need it nice and, and... And by the way, we'll talk about superfoods after the end of course exam and why it's important that you eat the right kinds of foods so that your brain doesn't get inflamed and become smaller. They're called superfoods. We'll talk about it. It's not... Yes, whole foods is good, but it's not really what I'm talking about. All right, so... So, guys, bottom line, derived traits are those characters that we just talked about. When we circle... Rabbits and what was the other? Monkeys. And monkeys. What was the derived trait there? Hair. Hair. When we circled the shark, the bird, the monkey, the rabbit, what was the derived trait? Vertebra. So there's the derived trait is the one that defines the clade. The character that wasn't there before in the fossil record or what have you, but then is there after everything else that came from that branch. Does that make sense? It creates branches. All right, so let's... When we look at this, when we look at this, we know that all organisms... We know that all organisms use DNA as genetic material. Guys, who cares? Focus. This is being recorded. Please. So what we have here is DNA as genetic material. Right? And we've, all, we've studied this, and I tell you this now. All organisms on Earth, organisms, living creatures, of course, we know, viruses are not, are not considered, uh, well, some people consider them alive, but let's just say they're not. Not all viruses have DNA. Some viruses have only RNA. But they're an exception. They're not living creatures. They're not organisms for sure, because they're not, they're not, they don't have cells, right? So... Whether they're alive or not is, is a matter of debate. Um, most, I guess by our definition, the answer would be no. But we know that all organisms on Earth have DNA as their genetic material. And we studied DNA in detail, haven't we? We know how, how it's replicated. We know how we transcribe it. Hold on, let me pause this.
And so, how we make RNA, how we make proteins, right? So we know how DNA works, and we know it's genetic materials in every living thing. Well, think about what that means. There's a, co that, there's a consequence to that. What does that suggest to you if, 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 we have, if everything has DNA, what could we do with that information? What does that information tell us all by itself? And then what can we use? How can we use that information? Anybody get, make a guess? How can we use the fact, the idea, that every living creature has DNA? In con exactly. Wow. Exactly. Somebody's paying attention. See, it's all about context, right? So you can use that a lot of different ways, right? We can use it to clone things, to solve diseases, right? But in context of our discussion thus far, right, we can use DNA to try to figure out how closely related we are to someone else or something else. And we do that all the time. The idea that people d want to argue this, I, I'm just shocked that anyone would want to argue this statement. And some people do, all right? I'm shocked because, guys, if you don't know who the father of the baby is, what do people do? <laughs> Maury Povich and those guys. A DNA test. Because if the DNA is close enough to the, to the, to the individual, what do we say? That's the father. We know who the mother is, but sometimes we don't because they were adopted. We can identify the mother and the father, right? And nobody argues that. But then I tell you that the, by the same logic, if any DNA we share with another creature, what do we say then? We, we must have derived that DNA from... Odds are we derived that DNA from... A, a common ancestor, because where do we get DNA? Where do we get DNA? From our parents, from our ancestors, correct? Correct. Our DNA came from our ancestors. So any DNA you share with me came from a common ancestor between us. And we can, sh we can look and tell, us, tell you exactly where that DNA came And bless you, and we've actually used it, the 23 and me can actually take that DNA, that information, and we've collected so much that we can say these people, people with this DNA came from over here, and then people from this DNA came yeah, from over there. So Their good. ancestors came it from there. Cost, it costs like over $100 to, to make it. Uh, it, it depends. Are we all clear on that? Yeah. So DNA is another line of evidence that we're going to be using, and of course the proteins that are similar because of the DNA. All right, we're going to continue this tomorrow. So... This is important because that means that the DNA changes over time. Which, if you remember correctly from our discussions on transcription and translation, if the gene changes, what else changes? Exactly. The RNA changes. And I couldn't, I'm going to put triangle for change. Triangle means changes, the Greek letter delta. And... That means if the RNA changes, of course, that means what? The proteins change. And if the proteins change, that means the characters change, right? So the fact that you have differences in DNA, we have, and we have similarities in DNA, how can we use that? Think about these three, these three kind of proposals, these assumptions. How can we use that to help us determine how closely we are related to another group of organisms? Perfect. The, say it again so everybody can hear it. So the less you change there is in the DNA, the closer the individuals are related to one another. Anybody who's watched Mari Povich knows this. Mori. Anybody who's watched daytime TV and they see, I know you guys watch in the summer, in the summer, I know you do, and you're like, whose baby is this? What do they do? They freak out. No, what do they do? What does Mori do? DNA test. Because if the DNA matches the dad, the man, what is he? Papa. Papa. <laughs> right? So we know this. You know this, don't you? 
Yes, it's real. I mean, the stories might be false, but the idea of using DNA to, to identify if someone's close to someone else, that is real, obviously, right? So DNA, DNA can be used to look at how close things are related to one another. Gosh, guys, if we can use DNA to identify a, a human father and then to take that father and force him, in some cases, force him to pay child support, right? If that's possible, and it is, and we do it all the time in our culture, is that correct? Yeah. Then why are we surprised that we can't look at DNA and say we are related to chimpanzees when we share 98.9% .9 of the same DNA as chimpanzees? Why can't we say that we're related to them? We don't want to culturally accept it. I get that. I understand that, right? And putting aside the religious problems with it, we have to, sit, we have to seriously discuss. You have to really take that as a fact. We accept it as a fact among humans. We have to understand that we can, we can compare it to DNA among other creatures. And if we, the more similar we it is, the assumption is, the more closely related we are to those organisms. Are we good with this? Okay. So that's an application of the... And by the way, I've given you... What have I done already? I've given you three ways of describing this one. And the quiz on Friday is going to require you to state this, make this statement, write it as exactly as you see here, and then write it in your own words. In this video, I've given you three or four different ways of looking at this statement. And this one, and this one. So if you don't understand these, you need to see me before Friday. Does everybody understand how genetic information can be used to, to compare how close one species is to another? So use, all of us use the same 20 amino acids. All living things on this planet use tw the same 20 amino acids. And in fact, those of you that go work with us at Case tonight, uh, this, this summer, you're going to see we can take genes from a human and we can put in a fish. And the, the stuff that that, make, that gene makes, it will be expressed in the fish. If you take that gene, you could grow that protein, the same protein that's in humans, it could be expressed in a fish because we share common characteristics because of all this stuff we've been talking about so far this, today. All right. So all humans have the same or all living things use the same amino acids. It's not like bananas use different amino acids than humans. We all use all 20. Different amounts. Some of us produce more phenylalanine, let's say, than alanine or what have you. But we all use the same basic 20 amino acids. And we know that. You've, you've learned that. We've gone over it. This is an amino acid. You know the structure of it. You've seen it. To re of course, here's the same 20 amino acids. And we, we, already, we already looked at amino acid structure. I'm not going to go through that. Peptide bonds. I expect you time and to remember that, that and just because I've seen a certain, our colleague, our timekeeper, look at her watch, I want to respect your time. I'd say you put away your stuff. We'll finish this on Monday. Look that, look that homework assignment up. Uh, good luck. Hopefully you guys come tomorrow for that English intervention. And look at these. Look at these. Which of these... Which two species, which two of these three are most closely related? I'm not even, you guys make your choice, write it down. I'll tell you the answer in just a second. Hurry up, we only got a minute or two left. By the way, you're probably going to have to do this on the end of course exam. I promise you, you're going to have to do it on my test. So let's look at it together. A-A-T, 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 A-A-T. No difference, right? CGC, CGC, uh oh, CAA, and then CAC. We have a difference where? Where do we see a difference? Three and four have a, have a big difference here, right? Then CGAA, there's AGAA. So, kind of these two, do you agree that these two are different here? And then here's uh, GAA, so that's the same. So, these two are different. Actually, no, that's not true. It's these three, isn't it? These three are different. And then here's GAA, same. This is the same. Do you agree? There's no difference. This is the same. Please don't leave. And then complain that you don't understand. Now, these two are the same here, but different from the previous two. Do you agree? And GAT, GAT, 
TTT, TTT, GCAA, GCAA. You see the same? You see the same? So now, which, do you, which of these two are the, are, have the least amount of differences? One and two have the least amount of differences. Look at them. These two have how many differences? Just these two differences. These, these three have three differences, don't they? And these four have... All, I, 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 miss, I did not circle all the differences here, but you can see there's a difference here. And there's a, that's it. So these four have differences. So one and two are the most similar. Everybody agree? Yes. yes. All right.